Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, on our second lecture with Dr. Ruth Gornin today, speaking about Gregory of Tatev, Gregor Tatevatsi. In the first lecture, Dr. Gornin introduced the study of cognitive science of religion and brought it together with the theology and the belief in the naturalness of religious belief. While we reflected on the role of mysticism in the first lecture, today, Dr. Gornet explores further this idea through the Armenian church, Vartapet Grigor Datevatsi. In his monumental work, The Book of Questions, Mir Kartsmans, completed in 1397, he integrates the best theological, philosophical, and scientific insights into an impressive synthesis of Christian knowledge. At, that, at times, Tatevatsi has been likened to Western theologians such as Thomas Aquinas. However, he has also been accused of succumbing to Western influence and in the place of, cent in the place of central orthodox elements. One of these elements seem to be mystical theology. The lecture aims to show that while mystical theology is not so evident at first in Gathevatsi, nevertheless, it is foundational to his entire doctrine of God. So today I present to you again, Dr. Ruth Gornet, speaking on knowing and unknowing God, Gregory of Gathev's rational and mystical doctrine of God. Thank Please. you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shahin Yan. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, what I would like to do tonight is give you, before we enter the deeper um, contents of Batevazi's work, a short overview over his life. Then I'd like to introduce the theology, the doctrine of God, and then explore his cataphatic theology. I will explain what that means and his apophatic theology and why I think his apophatic theology is foundational in his whole approach to the doctrine of God. So let's start for those who are not entirely familiar with Patibatsi, with his short Overview over his biography. Grigor Tativatsi was born in probably 1344. The Heisman Wurk um, reports that at an early age he became a disciple of the famous Bartabet of Hannes Vorodnitsi. He then went on to become a deacon, was ordained a celibate priest in Jerusalem and became a Vartapet himself. After Vorotnitsi's death, he succeeded him as head of his monastic school. So I'd like to show you the slides, but for some reason, they don't go on. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. So you you have a few um, notes of what I've already told you. So the dates of his life are um, not entirely clear, but it gives you a rough idea. 1344, 46 to 1409. Okay. He, so I told you he became head of the monastic school, successor to um, Borodnitsi. Um, the, the school itself had to relocate several times. The political landscape was very insta instable at the time, um, but the school 
or you might also say the higher school, the university, settled eventually at the monastery of that death. Satipatsi's thought is not only rooted what you would expect in Greek and Armenian Orthodox tradition, it also heavily um, refers to Hellenistic philosophy and is also strongly influenced by Western Latin thought. Um, for, for the background, we have from the 13th century, Roman missionaries coming into the region, first in Cilicia, but then also in Greater Armenia. And in the 14th century, um, a Dominican Armenian Brotherhood, the Fratres Unitores or Unitoros, Mirbano, was founded at the monastery of Krna in Nachichevan. At their monastic school, Western philosophy and theology was taught, and many Latin works were translated into classical Armenian. So we have here an influx of new ideas, new, new methods, and this fascinated many of the young intellectuals of the Armenian church and attracted them to Roman Catholicism. Armenian intellectuals on the other side wanted to fight, to fight back, wanted to defend Armenian theology against criticism by the Unitors, and of course, wanted to win back their um, young students to Armenian Orthodoxy. Vorovnitsi was at the spearhead of this fight and his disciple Vatibatsi followed him in this. However, it is important to know that the Armenian Vartapets did not simply reject Latin thinking. Like other Vartapets of the time, also Tatevatsi listened carefully to the arguments and ideas, integrated what supported Armenian doctrine, and omitted what is incompatible with Armenian orthodoxy. As a result, his work is saturated with Latin ideas and arguments. Furthermore, it seems that he copies the clear structure he found in Western textbooks. I will show you in a moment what precisely that means. One of his most famous works is the Girkartsmans, the Book of Questions, which was written at the request of his students. That's what he tells us in the prologue to the whole work and completed as already mentioned in 1397. The book of questions was later printed in Constantinople in 1729. And this is the opening of this printed edition. Um, 1729, and it, it comprises 809 pages. So, comprehensive work. The book is a comprehensive exposition of the Armenian Orthodox doctrine, composed in the form of questions by a disciple named Atram, to which Tatebatsi provides the answers. It is clearly structured. It contains, you can say, the macrostructure um, contain, contains 40 chapters, Luch, which are grouped into 10 parts, Hatork. At its beginning, um, the book provides an overview of the 40 chapters, which is called the Great Index, Metzangen. Each chapter then, again, within the book, presents a list of its paragraphs. Each paragraph contains one or several questions. The answer to every question is again often structured, so numbered, and so on. I will focus today on Tatevatsi's doctrine of God or theology in its narrower meaning. And you can find this in part three, chapter eight. So he 
can see here on the slide the microstructure. You can see in the margins the numbering of the answers, I, Ben, and so on. So that's, that is very much the way Latin textbooks from about the 12th century, late 12th century, present their manuscripts. Um, so you can very easily find um, the suggestions, arguments, and so on. And he um, takes this over in his structure. So you can easily find what you are looking for in this mm -hmm. book. It's very helpful. Okay, let's take a look at the doctrine of God in general. Tatibatsi's doctrine of God, you can see this, um, the, the title, the heading there is called On the Theology of the Holy Dionysius, Parax Astatsabanutyun Surboin Dionysiosi. This already indicates that the Tatibatsi is very strongly guided by the anonymous 5th or 6th century Neoplatonic mystic Dionysius, the Areopagite. However, as I already indicated, he also integrates many other sources, not only Greek philosophy, Greek and Armenian fathers, but also me medieval Latin theologians. I will show you this in one example. Um, but today I would like to focus on his systematic propositions and explanations. The problem with the sources is often that Tativatsi does not name them or does not name them precisely. Sometimes he just says, the theologian says, but where, <laughs> which work? Um, so it is very, very um, it's sometimes a challenge to find the sources he refers to, but often it's necessary to understand what he really wants to say. So, Tativatsi stresses that theology is first divided into what he calls affirmation, trutun, and negation. That's Barzumen. So in, in Western theology, you would call that, that's the division into cataphatic and apophatic theology. And he goes on to further divide those two big divisions. The first three um, are typical, ideological and symbolic theology. They make up cataph cataphatic theology. And his fourth type, mystical theology, is identical with apophatic theology. The theological types follow Dionysius. They are related to the, the Neoplatonic idea that the whole creation emerged and is continuously emerging through an emanation or procession from the divine one and will be completed by the return back to the divine. So this idea is called the schema of procession and return, or the schema of descent and ascent. Every type of theology proceeds from a different stage of this whole movement of um, procession and return. I will start by describing the three types of cataphatic theology, and after that, expound apophatic theology. So, first, cataphatic theology, and the first type he mentions is typical theology. This type of theology starts from the first stage of the divine emanation. So it's still in the eternity, immaterial, beyond the world, the movement from the divine simplicity and oneness to the Trinitarian differentiations. So that means it deals with the doctrine of the Trinity, for instance, the tension between oneness and differentiation, 
the three persons, their relations, and similar things. We find here a highly rational approach that employs analytic method methodology, logic arg argumentation, and philosoph philosophical concepts from the Hellenistic Arist Aristotelian tradition. So we have here concepts like the common and the particular, substance, quality, quantity, relation, identity, the Aristotelian categories, cause, nature, essence, and so on. So this part of theology is permeated by, by philosophy. For example, Dati Vazi uses the philosophical, the Aristotelian concepts of the common and the particular to interpret the Trinitarian new issue of oneness and differentiation. So we have here a quote. So in um, paragraph three, he opens with a question, what is oneness and differentiation? That is, and now he translates this into philosophical terminology, the common and the particular of the divine. First, it is known that oneness and in substance creates identity, and oneness in quality creates likeness, and oneness in quantity creates equivalence, and oneness in relation creates particularity. Now the unity of the Holy Trinity is manifold and clear, especially as everything is in common, nature, will, kingship, etc. But the particularity and differentiation of the hypostasis are few. So that's his approach to this issue of um, oneness and differentiation. I will explain in a moment what precisely he means with this. I, what I first want to show you is the possible sources which lie behind his arguments. So you have on the left side um, Tativazi's text, particularly the part where he goes through oneness in substance and so on. And then in the middle, you have a quote from Aristotle from his book of Metaphysics. Um, there you can read, those things are the same whose substance is one, those are like whose quality is one, those are equal whose quantity is one. So you see the similarity. Um, so Dati Vazi uses this idea. He says in, um, in this quote, it is commonly known. So he refers to something his students probably already know. And it goes back to Aristotle. You can find this, for example, in the book of Metaphysics, book Delta. Um, but the metaphysics, we don't know whether it had been translated to, at Tatevazi's time. Mm -hmm. So we have the first known translation is from the 17th century, so that's rather late. But these ideas are often transmitted in other books, in compendia. Um, so it might be that there is a more or less direct link. Surprisingly, we have the third passage from Euripelin of Strasbourg, that was, he was a Dominican friar, and his companion, Theologica Veritatis, was translated by the Unitas in 1344. And there you have a passage with, which is very close to what Patibazzi writes. So um, you writes, that there is equality in God can be shown thus. Unity in substance causes identity, and unity in quality causes similarity, but unity in quantity causes equality. So you have this um, substantives here, those concepts uh, which Tatevazi too uses in this passage. <laughs> And we have other passages, for example, in Book Nine, um, but other passages also in, in Part Three, where Bartivazzi um, very obviously refers to you of um, Strasbourg, but 
he doesn't he doesn't name him. So they maybe I have to add the book of um, Hugh was not um, published and translated under his name in Armenian. It was ascribed to Albert the Great. So it's the Gürk um, Alperci. That's what it is often called. But we now know nowadays that it was um, Jürg Strasbourg who compiled it. So what does this mean? What is he arguing for? So the first, so his answer, um, oneness in substance creates identity. That's simply the, um, the idea from the Nicene Creed um, of the divine persons being consubstantial or homoousios. The substance, they have identical substance and therefore they are identical homoousios. Um, then the identity in in uh, the oneness in quality, um, that means they share the same attributions, for example, wisdom. So wisdom, every of the, each of the divine persons um, has wisdom and that makes them like, um, yeah, similar in quality. Then quantity, and this is this is a passage where we really have to refer back to you to understand why Dati Vatsi here says quantity um, creates equivalence. Why? What does he mean by that? Um, you says um, or refers to quantity of might, power, duration, eternity, and greatness. So it, it is not the quantity one or three, it's this quantity in power. And that's really something you need to know to understand this passage. It's one of those many examples here. So they have the similar quantity of the same quantity in power, eternity, and greatness. And then we find in Dativazi a fourth point, which I have set here in italics. Oneness in relation creates particularity. That's the fourth point he adds here. This point already um, also relates back to Aristotle. So we have in Aristotle, you have 10 categories and substance, quality, and quantity are the first three. And Dativazi adds the fourth category here, which is relation. Oneness in relation creates particularity. That's something you don't you don't find either in in the um, source. Um, in, the, in the passage of Aristotle in metaphysics or in you of Strasbourg. That's what he adds. And with that, he grounds particularity in oneness. So he stresses oneness over particularity here. So this is something which is important for him. He prioritizes oneness or unity over differentiation. Um, and if you go on in the quote, this is again stressed when he goes on to say, now the unity of the Holy Trinity is manifold and clear. So manifold means you have a lot of aspects which support the unity of the Holy Trinity, especially as everything is in common, nature, will, kingship. But the particularity and differentiation of the hypostasis are few. So you have here again the stress of on unity, on oneness. And that is exactly what the early patristics do. So um, the, if you go to the Capitolian Fathers, early patristic theology, um, what they do during the Trinitarian debates of the fourth century, they emphasize oneness over the division in um, particular persons. So that's their main concern. There's one God. And you find this, so as patristic theology goes on, and then into the Middle Ages, they are very preoccupied with the relations and particularities of persons. But here you have the stress on the oneness. And that's something 
in Badibadzi does not take over from his Latin sources. He stays with the with the stress on the oneness. So that is one aspect, one tiny part of his so-called typological um, theology. The second type of theology um, is named ideological theology, Pacharabhanagam. And this is, you can say, the second stage of the of this schema of um, emanation of procession and return so the divine emanation um, after differentiating itself in the trinitarian um, persons goes on to um, further divide itself into time and space into creation um, you have to hear a quote from paragraph 18. Having seen the beauty in the creations, we recall and name the cause of the creator. So the beauty of the creation um, leads us back to the one who, create, who created is or is the cause of this beauty. So the creation, you can say, reveals something about its creator. Creation has anagogical quality. It can lead to the creator if you can read the signs, and that's a very um, important motive. Also in the in the West, up to the High Middle Ages, you can find this also in Europe, Saint Victor, or in Thomas Aquinas. But it is not simply the whole creation. So we, it's not um, that we look out of the window and are led back to God. What Tatibatsi here with Dionysius means. Um, is the intelligible concepts, so the abstract, abstract concepts which you have here, good, beauty, light, life, wisdom, and the like. So it's more the immaterial abstract concepts, the ideas, um, their beauty, their goodness can lead us back to God. So again, this uh, um, the style of this type of theology is the same as the first, very analytical, logical, using philosophical concepts. Um, it doesn't change much. Now, this is the cause of a bigger change and you, you can read in the third type of theology, symbolic theology. This style of theology proceeds from the low, lowest point of emanation, the material world. So now the emanation, the divine emanation of, from the one has arrived in the material world. And um, again, a quote from paragraph 18, um, Dr. Vatsi gives an example. What does it mean for God to appear human or a lion, a spring, fire, light, etc.? And what does it mean that God sleeps, is awake, is angry, is sad? So these are attributions from the Bible. And he, he asks, how can, how can we say that? Um, his caution is that these material concepts are so remote from God that they can attribute it to him only when they have been, what he says, transformed. So they can't apply one-to-one. -one. They cannot be taken literally. They have to be taken as, figure, as metaphorical or figure, figurative speech. So, and here we find a dramatic change of, of style. Um, his style is no longer analytical, logical, or philosophical. His explanations become rich and almost abundant, symbolic interpretations of natural phenomena, which he then connects with biblical topics. So I, I brought you an example. Why is God called the sun? So the sun here is the material entity. So, and he goes on, there's a lot of examples. The fifth example is, the sun, since going from the east through the south, 
south, it lowers itself into the west and goes invisibly around the north and again comes up in the east. So that's the natural phenomenon we have. And then he transfers this to Christ. Similarly, the intelligible son Christ in the paternal breast is incomprehensible in nature. And having dawned from the Holy Virgin as from the Eastern regions and warmed with love, so that's the South, he humbled himself into the mortal nations, just as into the West and enveloped our frozen natures. And from the tomb into the heights again, he ascended in, in the East to the Father. So what I said, he, he takes this natural occurrence and interprets this in a very symbolical way. But you don't have any philosophical concepts here, or philosophical ideas. So that's his symbolic theology. So these three um, typical ideological and symbolic, symbolical theology are his cataphatic, his positive theology, what we can understand, what we can imagine. Um, now, the fourth type, the mystical theology, the apophatic or negative theology. So, mystical theology, Khordakan. In the schema of procession and return, this type of theology deals with the ascent from the creation back to the divine origin. So, we have the descent all the time, now it's the return to the divine origin. That means to understand to understand God from this stage in the movement of procession and return, the theologian has to leave behind the realm of the created beings, intel intelligible and material. So the return leaves everything created behind. And that's a very... Um, a beautiful passage here. Tativazzi writes about mystical theology. Having abandoned all sensory and the intelligible being, we pass mentally into the depth and enter into the cloud and the fog like Moses. And then we see him separated out from all beings, for he is neither body nor soul nor mind nor any other thing which we which we know or understand. And then we say he is unreachable, inscrutable, ineffable. He is incomprehensible and hidden, not only to us, but also to any type of intellection. Just as the prophet says, he made darkness his covering, and the apostle said, he dwells in inaccessible light. So, Tativazzi calls this the summit of theology. However, it's, as we already mentioned, it's very rarely treated in the Book of Questions. He discusses it, discusses it in, in a few sections, but they do not form a co coherent unit like his other types of theology. So you can say paragraph, 3 to 16 is um, typical theology. You wouldn't find a unit like this about mystical theology. It's rather, it's dispersed across the whole chapter. So you have a few remarks in paragraph 1, in paragraph 14, and paragraph 18, and that's it. It's important to note that Tativat, for Tativatsi, the mystical theology has virtually no extent. That's something, something he says. In contrast, the most prolix, he says, Basmaban, is symbolic theology because it deals with the multitude of material beings. So that's the longest, um, most comprehensive theology. And we have, for instance, his interpretation of the symbol of the sun in paragraph, in paragraph 20. It contains 30 interpretations of the sun. So in contrast to this, the fourth type abandons the multitude of beings. It goes away from this multitude and 
um, approaches the one again, the divine one. So he says, it courses towards the one who is completely without reason and without intellection, ineffable, incomprehensible, and is honored by the whole creation with silence. And I think this, this word silence, the Rukyam, is, is essential to understand his mystical theology and the fact that he doesn't talk so much about it. We have the accusation, um, particularly by one Western scholar, Mathieu de Durand. He was a Canadian patristic scholar um, of the 20th century and one of the few who um, wrote about the book of questions at Datebatsi. Um, but he accused Datebatsi of fleeing the apocryphism of his tradition and says he instead happily engages with the broad discussion of symbolic theology. Um, people have wondered whether this is due to to the Western influence, so Tati Vatsi um, has come to Western theology at this point um, at the cost of apophatism. Has he abandoned his tradition? For me, the answer is no, um, but we have to justify this no, because if we say mystical theology is so scantily treated in in his, his, in his book of questions, how can we say that? I think there are three aspects which can show that Dr. Vatsi is firmly rooted in the mysticism of his, tra in his tradition. First, we have to acknowledge that apophatic theology or negative theology in the East means something different than in the West. That's very important. Then I would like to show you that the whole theology, the whole doctrine of God is um, based on this negative, of this, of, on this mystical theology, um, even if he doesn't deal with it so much, you can see traces everywhere um, which are based on mystical theology. And third, you have to acknowledge that Tatebatsi himself has a spirituality which is immersed in the mysticism of his tradition. And that's another strong point. Mm. So let's first have a look um, about the different meaning of um, negative theology in East and West. In the Western theology, Negative theology is one of three ways to obtain, uh, to obtain knowledge about God. The so-called via negativa proceeds by excluding from God the restrictions of created beings. God is infinite, simple, that is undivided or not compound, eternal, atemporal, etc. So in the end, um, Western theology uses this way to yield positive knowledge. We know something about God if we follow the via negativa. We know that God is infinite, that he is simple, eternal, and so, and so on. For Tantivazi, in contrast, those divine attributions, simple, infinite, eternal, are part of the catapatic theology not of the mystical, not of the negative theology. Orthodox apophatism is not a way to know something through negating. It's an unknowing, ungitution, which requires to abandon the normal way of knowing. It is an understanding by emptying intellect and reason. Dadevazi explains that there is a side of God which is ineffable, anjarili because it transcends creation and because it transcends creation, it also transcends our senses. 
However, this does not mean that we do not know how, that, that we don't have access to it. We can encounter even this, this hidden side of God, but only through unknowing. Unknowing means abandoning the conceptual thinking, which with we with which we usually understand the world around us. The encounter of God's hidden side does not provide knowledge. We cannot describe his nature. We cannot define him, form a name, a concept. He remains, as Stativatsi says, in cloud and fog, in darkness, even in this encounter. This is what we would call the divine or mystical union, the highest form of encountering God, which leaves the one who experiences it without words, without concepts. For this reason, mystical theology cannot be expounded like the other types of theology. And with this, Tatibazi follows his great example, Dionysius, whose mystical theology is also the shortest of all his words. And yet mystical theology forms the brackets, the grounds on which all cataphatic theology takes place. It shapes its epistemology, the question how we know something, particularly God, how do we know God if he is ineffable, unknowable? And the use of language, the way we talk about something we ultimately cannot understand. So let's first take a look at epistemology. Tatebatsi stresses that human reason is essentially inappropriate for understanding God. He gives two reasons. Created beings are limited, God is uncreated and hence unlimited. But the limited, the mind, cannot hold the unlimited, the, the divine nature. The measured, Chapavurujun, cannot measure, measure, chapel, the unmeasure, anchaputjun. So makes it clear already in the in the words that there's a, a logical impossibility here. And second, the mind is aimed at grasping existing entities, things around us, limited things. Therefore, he, he writes, that which is above being is above knowledge. And these two um, these two principles are old patristic principles. We find them already in Gregory of Nyssa and then also in Dionysius. The mind is not per se able to grasp the divine. And there are two ways to deal with it in theology. We can say the first way is the mind, the inappropriate limited mind needs to be extended or illuminated to speak the unspeakable. He has a very um, beautiful formulation, Charel Sandra, Sandra Ren, um, right at the beginning of the, of the part, the part um, three, chapter eight. Now, the first way we have to ask, how is the mind illuminated? How is this limited mind, which can only grasp existing entities, how is it illuminated? And Tatibatsi says the mind is illuminated by faith in Christ. The faithful first has to grasp the divine truth of the Christian faith, such as the Trinity, how God created the world through the Logos, um, how the Logos became incarnated. So we have first to accept those revealed truth, and then the mind will be able to contemplate the Trinity, reflect by applying reason to this. So it is not required that we just accept something we don't understand, but we, we are given the revelation and then we can apply our mind to it. But the truth, the Trinity, that God is three in one, that the Logos created the world and so on. We cannot reach this 
by our own reason. We have to we have to accept it. We have to accept the revelation. But then he is happy to apply all the tools he has, all the philosophy, logic, and, and analysis um, to understand this, to rationally understand this. So faith and reason go together, and that is what forms cataphatic theology. But the the foundation, the basis of it, of it is the idea that our mind is, in the end, limited to grasp the divine. So we need to be illuminated by faith first. So um, there's the second way. So the mind is limited, and then mystical theology provides a second way to deal with it, that is to abandon the mind altogether. So the principle from apophatic theology that the mind is essentially inappropriate to see God re results in these two ways. The first is the illumination by revelation, and the second is the abandoning of the mind to enter the cloud, the fog, to experience God and um, let go of conceptual knowledge apophatic theology. So another area is language. So we we have dealt, or Dr. Batsi deals with epistemology, with the, the question of how we produce knowledge, how we arrive at knowledge. And the second important area is language. Um, like the mind, also language is limited and inappropriate to capture the divine. And this has consequences for the use of language within theology. So first, language has to be understood in, in a particular way. And um, Tatibatsi discusses the um, all the attributions which begin with an the negative particle. So he discusses um, concepts like unmit or unskein. So he writes without mind um, and without sense, which we say of God is applicable not according to deficiency, but according to excellence. As when we say without reason and foolishness, that's a quote from the first letter to the Corinthians, it means to have reason and wisdom more excellent than ours. And when we say to empty, it signifies greater power. And to become weak on the cross, it signifies is God's greater power, and so on. In the same manner, also saying without mind and without sense signifies the excellent. Gerasons, excellent, super eminent, transcendent. So unmeet without mind means in relation to God, not mad or a lack of mind. Rather, it, denot it, it denotes the lack of human, of the limited mind. The limited human mind is absent in God and therefore God's mind is more excellent, super eminent than ours. So those negations which the Bible attributes to God have to be understood in a particular way, which we would call hermeneutics of super eminence or hermeneutics of transcendence. So we can't take them literally, but we have to apply um, specific particular hermeneutics to it. That's his first point. The second is words um, apply in a limited way to God. Common words, philosophical content, concepts for created beings can, can be applied to God, but only to a limited extent. Some or the main aspect of such a concept um, can serve to illuminate a divine trait, whereas other aspects of the term do not apply. We have a beautiful quote um, from paragraph five. He 
discusses the different attributions. Why is God called Father? Since he is the source and the beginning from which everything emanates. That's the answer. Why is he call, called Son? Why is the Logos called Son? Since just as a beam of light from the sun, the sun also was begotten by the father. And this is, I, I find this very interesting. Why is he not called mother from the female gender? Because an offspring proceeds originally from the father. This is um, antique biology. So um, human birth was more or less imagine, imagined like plants. We yeah, have the seed. The female is the vessel, and the seed is like the plant from which it came. So um, things like the, the, the female egg were discovered in the 19th century. You have this um, idea also in, in, in Aquinas, for example. Mm. So the, the human seed replicates itself, and therefore it is closer to the father and not so much to the mother. And that's why it is more sensible to call God father than mother in the Trinity, in the Trinitarian persons. And for the Logos, why is he not named daughter? Because a son resembles the father more than a daughter. So what I find interesting in this quote is, Tatibatsi is open to discuss those questions. They are not heretical. Yeah. Well, why he really asks why why wouldn't you call God mother? Why not? But he has the reason that um, this shows he has a very specific meaning in mind of this term father. It is limited. God is not like a human father. There is no um, no no. Um, physical traits implicated. Um, it's a metaphor which applies to a certain extent. So the father is used, the word father is used to express um, the, the closeness to um, of father and son. That's it. Um, we have another example, um, the number three um, in paragraph Five, Tatebatsi uses the number three to um, explain a lot of aspects of the Trinity. But then at the end, he stresses, but we call it Trinity to differentiate it from the number three. So certain aspects apply, but it's not identical. So words, concepts, ideas from our created reality are limited in their applicability to God. So that's the limited application of words. And the third point is paradoxical or contradictory language. Mystical experiences cannot be expressed in proper speech. That's a common experience um, in mystics in, in the West and in the East. Mystics therefore often resort to paradoxical language. So, for example, Dativazzi, when he describes the character, character of mystical theology, he, he writes to comprehend, to comprehend the incomprehensible incomprehensibly, to envision the invisible through unvision. So he plays with words. I think he, he tries to create something new um, by this illogical combination of words. So another um, example would be um, when he explains why the Bible speaks um, about God in terms of eternity and time at the, at the same time. Um, he, he has a paragraph in which he explains the attribution of ancient of days from the book of Daniel to God. And then he goes on to say, it is to be known that by saying ancient, it signifies eternal, and day signifies time. This is what it means when he is called eternal, and time and day, as in, you are from eternity to eternity, and your years do not pass. And then, 
On the other hand, um, the day of the Lord will come, and the day of the reckoning of our Lord, and Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today, which is time and forever, which is eternity again. So the Bible is not shy to apply those contradictory ideas, eternity and time, to God in the same manner. God's eternity, I think that is the idea behind it, is not a lack of time. Even though God is beyond time and unaffected by the change of time, but he is the Lord of time. He is, yeah, he, he has command over time, and therefore he has the fullness of time at his disposal. So this, what is logically contradictory, eternity and time, fall together in God. And thus, that's the paradoxical um, nature of language that the Batsi uses sometimes to express things. So, my last point is the practiced faith which is, in my view, another very strong argument um, to say Dati Bazzi has not abandoned his mystical background and tradition. So I think what is often forgotten, especially in Western theology, um, is that also in the Middle Ages, for Aquinas, that's true, um, too, true too, um, that these people were immersed in, in daily liturgy. They lived liturgy. Tatibazi, of course, he was a teacher. He was not a mystic. His texts are not mystical. Um, and when we read um, his works, they are extremely clearly ordered. He has a very systematic approach, which is necessary for teaching. So he structures the material for his students for understanding. Um, and he wants to answer, respond to the desire, desire of his time, which was triggered by the Unitors and the Dominicans. Um, and this, this systematic way of Western thinking, um, all this contributed to a very highly theoretical character, character of his works. But he still was a monk. He lived in a monastic context. He was a priest, and as such, occupied with the daily monastic prayers, with the celebration of the Patarak. So, and it's also important to know that he taught liturgical singing, sacred painting. So we can say he was fully immersed in the mystical tradition of his church. And it would be very strange to imagine that someone who um, experiences this tradition so intensely every day would, would even think about evading this tradition. So, I think there are a few glimpses already in his theoretical work. We have, for instance, the way he describes mystical theology in the Book of Questions. I've given you a few quotes. For example, when he talks about the divine radiance, with, which is the inscrutable light and wisdom, these expressions, they, they are so beautiful. We pass mentally into the into the depth and enter into the cloud and fog like Moses, or when he speaks of the silence of the creation. For me, that, that sounds like personal experience, which stands behind all his reflections. But there are also a few glimpses of, um, of mystical experiences in his work. Um, longer text, for instance, the way he describes, no, that's the wrong paragraph, sorry. Um, for example, in his, in his sermons. So it is important to know that the sermons are probably not um, actual sermons held to an actual congregations. They seem to be um, rather examples which he wants to give to his, to his students 
as examples to preach. And uh, as you may well know, it's not only his sermons in the, in the in the books, but also sermons by others. So they are rather instructions how to preach. And even in his sermons, you will find his structure when he goes on now in and Yerod and so on. So sometimes I think he always his breakfast like this. Yeah. He's so structured. But there you also find this mystical background. I brought you one a bit longer um, example. So that's um, a sermon on the Eucharist and John 6, 52. And he describes the worship, the Padara, when the priest descends from the Bima into the entire church and incenses and returns. So you have here the um, schema of um, procession and return. And that's what, that's the divine procession and the return, but that's what the priest does during the liturgy. This signifies the sweet radiance which descends from God to the intelligible classes of angels before descending to rational man and then to the animals and to the last of beings. Entering the church with music signifies the angel's conversation, which is inaudible to us, whereas the hymns signify the songs of the apostles, which originate from the, from the prophets. The psalm of the day is read afterwards, Consider that the, the, the psalm is chanted uninterruptedly in the morning, at noon, and in the evening. This is all encompassing the past, the present, and the future. So the liturgy becomes, becomes cosmical here. The whole cosmos is affected. And the Alleluia is the song of the angels. A verse of the psalm is always associated with the Alleluia, so that the songs of the angels may be intertwined with songs of the people. So Dativatsi describes the whole worship as a visible guide to the invisible, invisible, the liturgical actions, what you can see, the smell, the music you can hear, all this addresses the senses, but Dativatsi makes them transparent towards the transcendent. The faithful are directed to the sensory impressions first and then guided to abandon them towards the invisible, inaudible, ineffable divine. The sermon becomes mystagogical explanations as to how the Padarak padar, padar leads through the visible and sensible rites to the invisible God. And with this, the worship itself becomes mystagogy. And we have, we have literature from the 8th century, Byzantine, for, for example, Germanus of Constantinople, who do very similar things. And so um, Dativazi follows this here, um, the worship as mystagogy. So this is one example. You can have more example in, in his sermons. So to come to a conclusion, I would like to say that Ibatzi's theology represents an impressive approach of theological thinking, which merges a wealth of traditions to defend and make intellectually accessible the Armenian Orthodox doctrine. His highly systematic, analytical, and logical style of thinking and writing, his sometimes concise way to interpret theological topics, leads to a rational and sometimes dry appearance of his theology. Nevertheless, he does not evade the mysticism which is characteristic of his tradition. This mysticism is greatly honored by its foundational function for the whole of the doctrine of God. And of course, by the silence in which true mysticism is accomplished. Mm. And with this, I thank you very much for your interest. <laughs>